Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Talk Junkies, where tonight's going to be a very interesting night, as it is each and every single week here at Talk Junkies. Um, just myself this evening, Jesse will be joining here shortly. It's a possibility he'll be here at 7.30. Uh, we will see. But if you were interested in last week's podcast, we did have an author on, um, Randall L. Gilmore, and we talked about the life of Jesus and his book um, that he uh, recently wrote about Jesus and, and just the seed of life and what have you. It was a very interesting uh, podcast. There's quite a bit of people who tuned in and listened to that podcast. So I want a, a huge thanks to you all for listening to the podcast that I did with Randall. He's a great guy. Um, he texted me tonight and said he was praying for me for the podcast this evening. So Randall, again, thank you for that. And it was just a blessing to have you on. We're going to kind of continue down this path of just trying to understand what it was that happened in the past. You know, we had uh, a couple weeks ago, we had a, a gentleman who was a deist on and we kind of got into um, the Cathars, the Gnostics, stuff like that. And again, last week, like I said, we, we talked with Randall about Jesus. This week is going to be very interesting. We're going to talk about the books of Enoch. And not necessarily, yeah, not, not at all the conspiracy side of what the book of Enoch is, but just, you know, the bare bones, the factual evidence, or what it is that we can actually see, feel, and grasp. And there's no better person to bring on than a gentleman by the name of Philip J. Long. He's an author of the book of Enoch for Beginners, He's written a couple books, it looks like, and he's contributed to several articles and book reviews for theological journals. He currently serves as an editor of the Journal of Grace Theology. He has served as an intern pastor in Michigan and California and served as a teaching pastor at Rush Creek Bible Church. Philip, how you doing, man? Thanks for joining. Great. Rock on. Um, so I guess kind of where I want to start, I, I, I read a little bit of the, uh, of the Book of Enoch online, and I know that you said that's probably not the best thing to do, but when did it start and when, when did they find the Book of Enoch? Oh, um, I guess the earliest uh, reference to someone reading the book of Enoch is in the Bible itself. Jude, uh, the little book of Jude, second to the last book of the New Testament, quotes the book of Enoch, um, the first chapter of Enoch, uh, and uh, refers several times to things that are found in the the first book of Enoch. Uh, probably Second Peter knew uh, First Enoch as well. Uh, obviously, there were many others in the early church that knew First. The things we know about First Enoch uh, existed, and then it sort of drops off the map for uh, quite a few, uh, maybe centuries. Uh, it was rediscovered uh, really only in the 18th century. Uh, it was a, a book that was preserved. It's written probably in Greek. Uh, it may have been written in Aramaic. Parts of it. Uh, but it was rediscovered in the 18th century uh, by a, a Scottish adventurer type. Uh, the Ethiopians, the Ethiopian Catholic Church, uh, had used it as scripture for centuries. Uh, was fairly unknown in the in the Western world, and so uh, this uh, Scottish adventurer uh, found copies of it uh, in Ethiopia, brought them back to uh, Europe, uh, where they were translated and uh, translated first into French and then into English. And that's how uh, sort of the Western world became aware of uh, reading the book of First Enoch. Okay, so so they, they came back with copies. Is there an original copy of the books of Enoch? No, the earliest uh, complete copies are in uh, the uh, Ethiopic Gies is the uh, language. Uh, those date to, I think there's a couple of partial copies from the 14th century. The full uh, sort of canonical version, if that's the way to say it, is uh, 16th century. Uh, until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, uh, those were the oldest copies, full copies that were available. Um, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I probably should say uh, that First Enoch, what we call First Enoch, has five sections in it that are all different times. So it's like five little books of Enoch are put together into what we call First Enoch. No one in the ancient world would have said, open your scroll to First Enoch. There was no First Enoch. Um, there was something we call the Book of the Watchers or something we call the Book of Parables or something we call the Book of Luminaries, uh, the, the astronomical book, those sorts of things. At some point, they were edited together into this book that is translated into Ethiopic and becomes what we call today First Enoch. Um, so when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and they begin to you know, sort of catalog them and edit them. Uh, four of the five units that become First Enoch were found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were in Greek. So we know that the books were written at least in Greek, possibly in Aramaic, translated into Greek um, before the first century. So how important is it that they found, um, you know, parts of the Book of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Doesn't that even, doesn't that kind of give it more validation that it, maybe this book was legit? 
Well, it's it, depending on how you define legit. It is legit. Uh, it's, For sure, uh, it, it confirms that they are uh, the the five parts. All the five parts, uh, four of the five parts at least, were written prior to the first century. So prior to Christianity. Uh, nobody's going to doubt uh, chapter one because that's in the book of Jude. Uh, and so, but uh, until the Dead Sea Scrolls, we didn't have confirmation that those parts were as old as they are. Um, and so now today, of course, we would refer to the whole book of First Enoch as, as we publish it today as dating before Christianity. Now, the reason that's important is there are, there are things in the Book of Enoch that uh, are, and the Book of Enoch is Jewish. It's a, it's a, an example of uh, what scholars call Second Temple Period Judaism, so early Judaism. And some of the things that are found in uh, these these sections of Enoch, um, there's things in the New Testament that make you go, "Ha! Oh, did they know that?" For example, uh, Jesus regularly calls himself the Son of Man. Uh, and talks about himself very messianically. Well, in the fourth, uh, or in the book of the parables, there's a section in there that does talk about a messianic figure in ways that make you think, oh, that sounds a lot like Jesus. There's some ethical teachings that sound a lot like uh, Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, for example, and then some apocalyptic sections that uh, are helpful perhaps for understanding uh, parts of the book of Revelation. So it's Jewish theology, uh, Jewish uh, thinking, um, and uh, that provides background, sheds light on uh, the New Testament, okay, as so well as the development of Judaism. For sure. So uh, what's the big controversy behind it? That some people say that maybe it was Enoch who actually wrote, the, you know, the, the, he wrote the scriptures himself, and some others believe that it was someone else later on in, in a period of time in history. Have you seen any type or any type of evidence to suggest that Enoch did write it himself and that he did? Yeah, I don't know of any um, serious scholar uh, of Enoch literature that would ever say historical Enoch wrote what we call the books of Enoch. Um, Enoch lived before the flood. Um, and sort of the, the kind of the thing that got the books of Enoch written is the only thing the Bible says about Enoch in Genesis is he's the, he's the, um, a third from Adam and he lived, uh, uh, he, he walked with God and was no more. And he only lived 365 years. Uh, everybody else lives, you know, eight, 900 years in that genealogy in Genesis 5. Enoch lives this really short life, comparatively, um, and, uh, and walked with God and was no more. What does that mean? Well, you start to create stories. You start to create legends. Maybe he was this great prophet who had secret wisdom, so they create these books and put this information in Enoch's mouth. Um, I don't even, to be honest with you, I don't even know if people living, say, in the second century, reading this stuff when it was fresh, thought Enoch wrote this. Uh, there, are, there are dozens and dozens of books written, say, after the close of the Old Testament and later, that take some hero from the Old Testament and create a story about them. So we have Apocalypse of Abraham, and we have the Testament of Solomon, and we have um, a Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, where each of the Twelve Sons of Jacob um, kind of have this ethical teaching. And my favorite is uh, the, the life of Adam and Eve. So um, what would Adam have said to Eve after they got kicked out of the garden? And you get a, a nice book doc talking about that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's this, it, we call it pseudepigraphal writing. It's writing in a false name. And so, you know, nobody thinks... You know, the apocalypse of Elijah is written by Elijah. Same thing with, I think, Enoch. Well, I think, yeah. it's, I think it's interesting that it survives so long, though. You know, you, does that make sense? Because just reading just briefly a little bit about it, do you think it's just crazy? Like, like you said, there are parts in the book of Enoch that go with the Bible, but then you go a little bit further into it, and you see you talk about the watchers like you kind of went sure. into a little bit. And you see that these watchers were, I guess, intrigued by, you know, the beauty of woman. So they came down and then, you know— they did something that they weren't supposed to do. And what I'm saying is it's just well-written and I can kind of immerse myself in that. And, you, and you're right. It kind of does seem like kind of just as a, as a story because to walk and see the face of, of the Lord, I guess, is what Enoch says in, in those scriptures. And, you know, he's telling these, these, these fallen angels that, Hey, you're going to be an in, internal, what is it? Internal hell almost per se. Yeah. It's damnation. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's where the idea of hell came from or the books of Enoch. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this is of the idea that Enoch is the author is based on this really intriguing, um, uh, very, uh, very obscure verse in Genesis. 
uh, the thing you just mentioned, the Book of the Watchers, the first 36 chapters of what we call First Enoch today is usually referred to as the Book of the Watchers. Um, and it's based on this, again, really tantalizing verse in Genesis 6 that says the sons of God, which everywhere else in the Old Testament refers to angels, and uh, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they, um, I don't know what your uh, podcast is rated, but they, they came down and, and made babies, we'll say. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result, you have these giants roaming the earth. Well, that's all it says. Does uh, the, the result of that is the flood. God sort of reboots the system and and uh, wipes the earth clean. So what does that mean that angels and and humans slept together and and had these angel these demonic beings? And so uh, the book of the watchers expands on that. It, it 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 suggests names for the angels who came down. Well, what did the angels teach the humans? These sorts of things. And there's some really intriguing theology behind it. So when you read the Old Testament in Genesis, um, uh, humans are responsible for sin coming into the world. God said, don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin enters the world. Uh, Paul, a first century Jewish Christian writer, says sin entered the world through Adam. So when you read the book of the Watchers, sin doesn't enter the world through humans. It enters the world through through bad angels. Uh, who who do not stay in the place where they were appointed, heaven, uh, and come to earth and teach humans all sorts of terrible things, like how to make war, how to make weapons, how to write and read, and some of these sorts of things. And that leads to the, the corruption of the race. So rather than blaming humans for sin, it blames uh, demonic beings for, for sin. So what made you so fascinated in the Book of Enoch, in the, book of Enoch and, and, yeah. and the ones to, to follow suit? Uh, yeah, the whole pseudepigrapha, the, it's just a huge collection of other books that, that aren't in the Bible. Um, and I've always been fascinated with them. I, I remember even uh, before I was you know, going to college seeing you know, the lost books of the Bible, and you think, oh, what's that? You know, if you grow up in church and you, know, you go to Sunday school and you hear all the normal stories, you feel a little a little naughty that you, you got to look at the, the lost books, you know, and, uh, you know, you read the Apocrypha, you read some of the Maccabees books, you read some of this material. It's all very fascinating. Um, and so I've always looked at this as uh, background material for studying the New Testament, background material for studying the development of early Judaism. Um, my very first PhD class, uh, my, my mentor, Dr. Uh, mentor, uh, my first reading course, he he told me read the read the ap- apocrypha and pseudepigrapha, uh, Old Testament apocrypha and pseudepigrapha, and write a paper on it. Well, those two collections are about eh, a thousand pages a piece, big fat things. Um, and so I read through all of that material over a summer, and I, I put together about 350 pages on all of that material, summarizing background material and and contents. Uh, and then Enoch was just you know probably 10 percent of that. Okay. So, uh, so I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, you, you think that there are some good things in the Book of Enoch, oh, yeah. but there's it, it's probably most likely not true. It's most likely a super superhero type of book. Yeah, I don't want to describe it as fan fiction. Uh, but, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true in that this is the way some Jews thought sin entered the world, or this is the way some Jews conceived of cosmology. Um, if, if, you, if you sort of endure to the end of the, the book, the First Enoch, there's a section called the Epistle of Enoch, uh, which is um, wisdom literature, sounds like Proverbs, uh, you know, reads a little bit like the Sermon on the Mount, and it's, it's great stuff. It's True, yes, you should care for the poor. Yes, you should, you know, take care of the needy. That's the sort of material that's in there. So I'm, I guess I resist the idea of it's true or it's not. It contains things that are obviously true, but it's put into this sort of legendary mythological wrapper, which is that Enoch existed and had hidden knowledge that he was given. Uh, you know, the special revelation from God, and he ends up ascending to heaven, you know, to sort of keep that knowledge secret. Um, I think, you know, probably his community felt that this, you know, these books of Enoch that were circulating were the secret knowledge, and we were the insiders that really knew what was going on. Um, but it, it's it's the way you come to understand how Judaism develops. It's the way you understand how early Christianity developed as well, is to read this literature. 
Right. And I, it's, to me, I think one of the most fascinating parts about just, and again, I, I read briefly through it before we started the podcast for probably right around an hour. And again, it's just fascinating to, especially whenever he starts to see, you know, what is it? The seven mountains. And then he sees the, yeah. the mountain that the throne of God is on and just the being in the, in the, in the interaction of being in the presence of God. And just, you know, whenever I see something like that, where a human being maybe has spoken to God face to face, Mm-hmm. It, th- that's pretty, I mean, that's big news, right? And, oh, yeah. it, and, and again, what it, to say that it's, it's hard to say whether or not it's true or not, but either way, just to think about that in those times, if mm-hmm. it truly did happen, that's fascinating. That's yeah. really fascinating. So I guess I, a, a better question would be, what are the early, the earliest writings when it comes to religion that we can find and put our hands on that, that, that I guess is like factual evidential proof that the, these writings are legit or these writings were in those times. Well, I would say the Old Testament, obviously. Right. Uh, you know, we can debate about when individual books were written, but the Judaism and and really Islam too develops out of that same trajectory, uh, and we can put our fingers on those kind of books. If you're interested in, um, you know, some of the more apocalyptic things, angels and demons, uh, Zoroastrianism uh, influences Judaism and probably is in the background of some parts of, uh, of, uh, Enoch, uh, especially the punishment scenes and, uh, a lot of the cosmological scenes you were referring to, um, scholars call those heavenly tours or heavenly journeys. Um, it's, it's sort of a stock piece that you get in, uh, in, uh, the Enoch literature. He does it a couple of times in the book. Uh, and then that's kind of the theme of the second book of Enoch and the third book of Enoch, which are a little bit later. Um, you have these, these, epic you know it kind of reminds me i don't know if you ever saw the movie 2001 a space odyssey i get to the end of that movie and he kind of goes through this journey and it's all this flashy i think you're supposed to take drugs and watch it i'm not sure (laughs) Uh, but it's that sort of thing you just kind of are are flowing through this this uh this landscape and there's mountains and trees and things and and of course at the center of it for a jew would be the throne of god um i think there's a trajectory uh, to the throne of god stuff so you can go back to the old testament and see, uh, like Ezekiel 1, uh, the prophet there sees this very similar sort of um, um, epic sort of landscape with some epic sort of angelic beings that are full of eyes, so they're watchers. Uh, and uh, at the center of that is the throne of God, and he, he sees the, 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 the image of the reflection of the glory of God uh, on that throne. Uh, and so that uh, they call it, um, it's called Merkaba, uh, Merkaba, uh, which means throne in Hebrew. It's it's a type of mysticism where a a mystic is caught up into heaven and and sees sort of reality for what it is and the throne of God and, and angelic beings and those sorts of things. Uh, and so I think there's that trajectory there. You get it in in other uh, sort of religious experiences as well. It, and also just to further on that a little bit, I think one of the most interesting parts as well, again, again, it's, it's just, I guess all of it's interesting from what I'm saying, but is when he talks about the portals and the portals that, you know, yeah. that, that there's access to portals here on earth, right? In, in the scriptures that are here on earth. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you got far enough. There's a, a section of what, again, what we call first Enoch called the astronomical book. Uh, sometimes it's called the Book of the Luminaries, and it is almost entirely, it's its probably the most boring part of the book, uh, it's almost entirely an argument for uh, whether we should use a 360 or a 365-day calendar. And the moon and the sun pass through these portals on either side of the universe, and it tracks the months and these sort of things. And um, you get portals in um, Genesis. Uh, I don't know if you know the story of Jacob, where he uh, he has this vision of a ladder that, that goes up into heaven. It's a, a portal. And he, he's able to go up into heaven and sees angels passing up and down on this sort of thing. And that sort of inspires some of these journeys to heaven uh, that you get in First Enoch. Okay. So are, do you think that those those portals are something that exist here on Earth? Or is no, it- um, I think... Um, to be honest, this is just my opinion, and it's what I expressed in the book, is when Enoch, uh, or really any of this mysticism, describes cosmology, it's a, uh, it's a sacred cosmology. So to say you have all these mountains and you have these, uh, there's a section that describes these orchards of spice trees, and you go through and there's all these spices you know, in the world. Um, and at the center of all of this is the great throne of God on the biggest mountain. Well, what that's saying is that the center of the universe is the throne of God, and he is at the center of everything. And if he is the great king of the universe, how does a 
a great king express their wealth in the ancient world? Well, they do so by having, you know, we, we don't think of it this way, but spices were incredibly valuable. So if you owned cinnamon trees, you were incredibly rich. And God at the center of the universe has a whole orchard full of them. So, and there's other things in that section that it's 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 basically if you summarized it in a you know 144 characters or less, God is you know the most awesome creature in the universe, and he has all of the wealth and all of the power that that can be imagined. Um, so I think it's a, a sacred geography. It's a metaphorical. Um, uh, he's he's imagining. God as the greatest thing, how do you express that? Uh, and you get these sorts, same sorts of things with portals and edges of world and mountains and these sorts of things and other um, Mesopotamian mythologies. For sure. Yeah, and, and, and it, it does kind of make you wonder whenever you start reading it, you know, and kind of grasping what it is, is why would God create angels that would want to deceive him and go to earth and create these Nephilim? You know, does yeah. it, I mean, I don't, I don't know if, if he would give angels temptation as well in that in that sect. Well, that's that's kind of what the book of the Watchers is is saying is that that God allowed them some sort of free will, because they had a really they're judged. Strangely enough, they're not as judged as much for their fornication with women as they are for leaving their appointed place. Kind okay. of this thing that's in all five of the sections of First Enoch is there's appointed times and seasons and places, and the sun does what the sun does because God appointed the sun to do that, and the moon does what the moon does because that's what God made it do. These watchers, the bad watchers, uh, were were appointed to a place. They had things that they were appointed over, and they forsook that and kind of struck out on their own and came down to earth uh, to create the, these uh, these uh, gigantic beings. Um, and that's why they end up being judged. So there's, I think, a, a maybe a little bit of the, the cosmology of Enoch is everything is in its place. Everything works. Uh, creation works the way it's supposed to work. And you get that in Ecclesiastes and, and Proverbs and some other places in early Judaism. Okay. So do you... I, ha- I had a good question, but I, I'm trying to think of a word or a way to paint, paint, paint the picture. I guess whenever you talk about the the flood and you talk about you know um, in in the book of Enoch, you, like like it suggests in that book, is the reason the flood happened was because the angels did fall and they created mm-hmm. these giants and and God didn't want these you know He didn't want all that to happen. He was mad at the angels, like you said. Is there any of that in the New or Old Testament that suggests that? fallen angels did come to earth and they did go against God. And that's why the great flood happened. Well, yeah, that's what you get in Genesis six. I mean, that's the, the tantalizing verse that says the, the sons of God came down and and were with the women and, and created the Nephilim as they're called. Um, uh, NPL in Hebrew means fallen. So the Nephilim are the fallen ones. Uh, the book of Enoch says that when they were destroyed, their spirits became the demons, kind of, again, a little hint at maybe what demons are. Uh, and then uh, there are places in the New Testament that refer to Noah uh, as a you know, historical character. Um, again, Second Peter and Jude both refer to the time of Noah as a, a judgment on those angels. So there's a few little tantalizing hints in the New Testament. But um, uh, again, there's, I think that's why Enoch existed, is that you don't have a chapter explaining exactly what went on in right. <laughs> yes. So what is, what is three hundred? Cle- is it clefts? Is that what they call it? That's how big the giants were. Yeah, um, cubits. I think. Okay. So yeah. how how big would they have been? Well, I don't know what a cubic is. Or it's eighteen inches. Okay. So you know, four hundred fifty feet. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's again sort of legendary. Uh, I don't know. One of the things that when I wrote the book, uh, my book on First Enoch, is that uh, people are interested in First Enoch. Uh, they get little hints of it. And uh, part of that was from the the Noah movie that came out of quite a few years ago now. Darren Aronofsky. Um, boy, I can't remember who is in it now. Uh, Russell Crowe. Oh, yeah. And Hermione Granger. Yeah. Uh, whatever her real name is. Emma Watson. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it was, uh, you know, people, when that movie came out, people were calling me or texting me, you know, what in the world are those rock things? And, you know, basically that that film was an adaptation of the Book of the Watchers. And so, again, it's this tantalizing, what were those things? Here's a way of sort of explaining them. And uh, um, creatures in apocalyptic literature tend to get really big. Um, uh, by Third Enoch, there's a, an angel uh, called Metaron. I think he's 
he's so many parsecs. It's, I've calculated at one time, it's like, I don't know, 9,000 feet tall or something like that. Uh, you know, it's just this imaginary world where if things are, are bigger, they're better. And so God is the biggest thing. So he's got to be, you know, uber tall or something like that. I don't know that any of that was meant to be taken seriously. Yeah, no. And, and you see like people are trying to find like find and excavate larger humans. I know there's been evidence out there that there were maybe 10 to 12 feet tall people. I don't know how true that is, but I've seen pictures. Again, those could be photoshopped and what have yeah. you. But the there was a really good one I had for uh, April Fool's Day one year with these gigantic skulls that I saw floating around the Internet. But I think um, uh, you have evidence, you know, in the, in later biblical material, uh, the classic's going to be Goliath, right? So Goliath was reputedly nine feet six inches tall, uh, which is would be Guinness World Book of Records, I suppose, if it, if it were today. Um, uh, the, the, the Philistines as a whole excavations show they were larger than average people uh were they the descendants of the giants from the flood maybe <laughs> uh but uh it, it seems unlikely so i mean I, I i guess i'm asking you your opinion on this but do you think there there might have been legitimate giants that that kind of roamed the earth at some point in time if, if these books were to you know if, if it actually happened that way right the nephilim came down or the angels came down then they the offspring nephilim or sorry i'm getting that backwards either way they, there were giants at some point yeah. Maybe 12, 15 feet. Who knows? Well, let's not say. Yeah. Uh, Genesis 6 says there were giants and, you know, you know, full stop. There's no description. Um, as a Western American, when I hear giant, I think of you know the Jolly Green Giant or Jack and the Beanstalk Giant. Right. You know, somebody who's, you know, 75 feet tall or something like that. For sure. Um, you know, the cave troll from Lord of the Rings. I don't know. Just these <laughs> ginormous things. Uh, if you're a, you know, five foot two Jewish person writing the story, what's a giant? Very true. He's a guy who's eight feet tall. You know, it's, it's, it giant is relative and it's not a very descriptive term. Uh, so uh, at least in the, in the apocalyptic literature, like first Enoch and second Enoch and third Enoch, there were giants that God said, this is an aberration. That's not right. Destroys the world in the flood you know, sort of reboots the system, um, preserving it with Noah and his family. And I think that puts an end to the pre-flood world, whatever it was. Okay. So what are your thoughts on, in the part where Enoch talks about um, just how God showed him the creation of Earth? What were your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's it's good sort of early Jewish thinking about creation it's it's very symbolic and very uh, it 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 builds on the biblical material and fills in some gaps and tries to answer some questions and does does it in a really creative way uh, uh okay so i mean i guess w within enoch's experience when god shows him the creation of of the heavens and and the earth and like you said that's kind of where hell came from i guess mm -hmm. um do you see any of that in the bible the new testament or the old testament yeah, uh, as far as, I mean, I think uh, you can say that uh, in the Old Testament, there's an afterlife. Uh, people go, you know, sleep with their fathers. It means they're dead. Uh, but they talk about a place called Sheol, uh, the pit, uh, and it's just the place of the dead. Uh, in the New Testament, you have references to heaven, uh, the place where God sort of lives. Paradise is sometimes the word that's used. And you have references to hell. The Greek word is Hades. Um, uh, there's other words, Gehenna and Tardis, and a few of these others drawn from Greco-Roman mythology uh, to be the place where um, those who are judged go. So the righteous go to everlasting life in heaven. The, the judged go to everlasting damnation. So Matthew 25 calls it uh, the hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. In between the development from the Old Testament, where do people go? The place of the dead. Uh, and the New Testament, where you have this sort of two-level righteous go to heaven, unrighteous go to hell, uh, you have things like the Book of Enoch uh, trying to explain um, sort of the justice of God. If you have these people, angels, who have, who have forsaken their proper place and rebelled against God, what do you do with them? And they are put in this this horrifying pit. There's you know fire and chains and whippings and these sorts of things. It's sort of muted in First Enoch. Uh, Second Enoch, which is written a, a little bit later in history, uh, you know, 
you know, early, maybe first century, uh, still reflecting a Jewish worldview, you get more descriptions of the punishments, and they're even more in Third Enoch, which is, again, a little bit later uh, historically. And, and all of this sort of develops and develops and develops until you get something like Dante. So most of when you... we think of as hell is uh, what you learn from from Dante's Inferno or I always think uh, probably we learn more about hell from from Looney Tune cartoons or the far side <laughs> or something you know that's kind of the, the cartoony picture of hell uh, and a lot of that all goes back to first Enoch starting well what would people be tortured in hell like you know if they're down there being punished what does that look like uh, and you get you get Jewish expansions on that you get christian expansions on that um but it all kind of starts in first enoch um but the christians uh, in in correct me if i'm wrong is it is enoch and this is allegedly he's one of two people to ever see god correct as a human as human as a human being i'm thinking about that i would say most neither if you only stick with the bible enoch doesn't see god he walked with god and was no more uh, first Enoch describes him as seeing the glory of God. Uh, Moses in the Old Testament, he doesn't see God, he sees the glory of God. Uh, Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 1 through 3, he sees the glory of God. So uh, humans in the in Jewish literature can't see God. But didn't Enoch say that he saw his face and it was of metal or something like that? Oh, well, in first Enoch, that would yeah. be true, yes. He, okay. he's, but even then, that's a sort of a, it's not really seeing god god it's seeing a reflection of god you know how does god present himself right yeah you know. okay so what would you say would be like um and we got probably about like 30 more minutes it looks like um and we're moving f pretty fast man and because i haven't read all, all of them you still there i don't know what, what i'm the, here yeah i just had some weird noise coming in what would you say are, are some of the like the the best things that you've gotten out of out of writing your book and understanding what is the book of Enoch. And like you said, there's five of them, correct? Yeah. Well, let me maybe uh, repeat that. What we call first Enoch is five separate books okay. that existed in the first century. And um, for publishing purposes, they're put together. Part of that is because they were preserved in a single manuscript uh, through the Ethiopic church in the Ethiopic language. Uh, there is a second Enoch, that is a complete manuscript uh, that's written in the first century AD. And then the book we call third Enoch is written a little bit after that. So first Enoch predates Christianity and then second and third Enoch would post date Christianity, but not by much. Okay. So yeah. what, what have you gotten most out of, out of, out of all of your yeah. studies and knowledge of, upon the book of Enoch? Uh, well, uh, you know, I come at this uh, as a New Testament scholar, and so I'm I'm always fascinated to find uh, things that uh, shed light on, you know, say the book of Revelation, uh, sort of the apocalyptic worldview that you find in Revelation. You find something of that in Enoch. Um, I do, I, I'm very fascinated with the, um, uh, most people come at Enoch for all the mysterious angel stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of ethical teaching in First Enoch uh, that is remarkably similar to what we read in Proverbs and Sirach and the Apocrypha and then in Jesus in the New Testament. So it's this early earliest form of Judaism um, that may have been why the, the books were preserved by the Dead Sea Scrolls or in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, because that's an early form of, of uh, Jewish theology. Okay, so and, and we're not we, we don't have we're not going to get into this, but why do you think there is this overarching conspiracy within the Book of Enoch with the with all of that jazz? Because we talked on the phone earlier, we said we weren't going to entertain that, and I don't want to either. But why why is that the case? Why do people get that out of the Book of Enoch, in your opinion? Well, it's a mysterious book, and it's got some stuff in it that you know is is tantal in the same way that Genesis has these little lines here and there that are tantalizing and they sort of bloom into what we call first Enoch. Um, so too does Enoch have these, these statements that, that modern readers come to and uh, maybe not reading them in the proper context of the ancient world, you know, kind of fuels their already conspiracy theory things. And one of the things that um, I think is part of that is a flat earth theory which, you know, I don't put up with flat earth for very long usually. Um, but, I mean, if you read that 
astronomical tour, you could say, oh, look, the earth is flat. It's this big disc and it's got mountains at the edge and, you know, God is at the center or something. So if you already believed in a flat earth, you could take things in, in First Enoch out of context and prove your flat earth, I suppose. And there's other you know, this, you know, conspiracy stuff about, you know, the blood of the Nephilim still persists. And every once in a while, somebody asks me a question about that. And yeah, I think from what I, you get, like Zachariah Sitchin, and he talks about the Anunnaki, and I don't think that came from the Book of Enoch. That's more of just um, some other things. So, that, yeah, yeah. I, usually it's it's the little paranoid conspiracy stuff. And then you find it in this ancient book. And hey, the early church suppressed it. And, Eh, not really. So you talk in your book, you, and, and I didn't know you were an author until uh, just a couple hours before we started the conversation. I, I did a Google search on you and found you and yeah. found, you, found your book. I just purchased uh, the Book of Enoch, A Beginner's Guide. There uh, it is. Very cool. Yeah, that's on the way, man. So it'll be here in my house a couple of days. Normally, I showcase it here on the table in the middle, so I'll definitely put it on there next week when I'm doing the podcast. Um, but, but when you say it's a book for beginners on the Book of Enoch, why do you say that? Uh, cause the publisher titled the book for me. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Fair enough. They paid me to write a book, uh, uh, for beginners. It's, uh, the book assumes no, uh, prior knowledge of Bible and biblical studies. Uh, so the editors, when they came to me to write this book, they said, um, don't, you're not writing a book that's a commentary on the, you know, the Ethiopic text. Uh, I wasn't even really allowed to quote scholars. Uh, so there's a number of books that I used in my preparation of the book that appear in the for further reading section. But the editors are like, nobody knows who James Vanderkam is. Don't quote him. Uh, so they wanted it to be as um, as a sort of uh, a warm, uh, inviting uh, explanation without a lot of scholarly junk on top of it. Gotcha. Uh, so it's it's uh, if I were to be looking at this book, I would say this is really easy stuff. This is like really beginner stuff. Uh, people who don't know anything about Enoch, they tell me when they read it, wow, that was really good. I didn't know any of that stuff. So it's, um, uh, my tagline is it's not the book I wanted to write, but it's the book people need to read, uh, because it, 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 it really does try to dispel the conspiracy theory stuff. And it's a basic explanation of the contents of, of first Enoch. So there are people who still are, there are people who actually read this in, in it's part of their canon in the Bible. Yeah, it's it's part of the Ethiopian Church's canon. So um, you, you know, you're familiar with Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. Uh, there's all sorts of other flavors of Christianity: uh, Greek Orthodox, or Syrian Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, uh, Coptics, or Egyptian Orthodox, basically. And Christianity in Ethiopia is known as Ethiopic Christianity, and so they have a slightly different canon than uh, the Western Church. So the Roman Catholic Church has the, the 66 books of the, of the canon plus the Apocrypha. Uh, the Ethiopic Church includes Enoch and Jubilees, and I think there's a couple other things that they include as well. well I, I kind of find it fascinating that, it, that they still, or they read that in, as part of their canon because isn't that where they found the text? I guess the original copies, allegedly, if they do yeah, exist, that's, that's where they would be. They preserved it for you know, a thousand years, um, uh, if, you know, Ethiopia, if you think about it, is pretty cut off from world history. And they uh, they sort of develop separately from all of the church history, you know, about Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy and some of those sorts of things. And so they're kind of down there doing their thing um, until they're sort of rediscovered in the in the early 18th century and 19th century. Even today, there's not a not a lot of Ethiopic scholars, people who can read and translate this material. Um, and there is much more available than just Enoch. There's lots of other Ethiopic books that are out there, but there's not very many people who can read and translate that material and study it. Yeah, it's very true. And, and they have, and I, and I guess, sorry, were they all written in Ethiopia or do they have all the, the, yeah, they're preserved in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, all three, um, sorry, the uh, Enoch one, two, and three. Sorry, is what I meant to say. Yeah, all three of those uh, are written in uh, Judea, Palestine, uh, somewhere in and around Jerusalem. We don't know for sure. Uh, and first Enoch is fully preserved in Ethiopic and Ethiopia. And to be to my shame, I cannot remember where second and third Enoch are. For sure, uh, are preserved. Sorry, yeah. 
No, you're good. So, I, 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 can you get online and like see the preserved like book that that, that they have, or have you seen it with your own two uh, eyes? Type yeah, of thing? actually, I mean, I have a blog, uh, and I have all kinds. This is this is how I ended up writing the book. Is I put all this material on my blog seven or eight years ago, and if you Google stuff on First Enoch, nine times out of ten, you hit my blog. It's because nobody else is writing about Third Enoch, and so I've got some pictures of early manuscripts of. Uh, I think I have third Enoch and maybe I have second Enoch as well. I have a post on, um, you know, how to read Enoch, uh, you know, in English and if, you know, how do you find the manuscripts? All that stuff's published. It's all available. Okay. Yeah. You know, and I, I just didn't, I remember the first time I started reading the book or I, like I told you when we were on the phone earlier, I got online, I tried to read a little bit of it yeah. cause I was fascinated in, in it, but then like reading it tonight, I'm 33 years old. I mean, you know, I just got a little more out of it. And it just, you know, and you, you made it make more sense, you know, and, and I greatly appreciate that. But, and that was only, you know, it, I don't know how big the books are, you know, how many pages each one are, but yeah. how, how big is the first one? Well, it's 105 chapters, I think, okay. although some of those chapters are, are much more brief than what you would get in a Bible chapter. For sure. Yeah. Think, a couple sentences. Yeah. yeah. It's probably maybe a hundred pages, uh, you know, uh, think of reading, you know, Matthew and Mark together or something like that. Um, Okay, so what would what would be the okay? So it, it, you said that there's revelations kind of in the Book of Enoch. Is that in one, two, or three? All really, all of them. Uh, the the phrase or the word um, uh, apocalyptic uh, refers to unveiling a mystery, and so anything that is um, described as an apocalyptic book, the writer is unveiling a mystery or unveiling a secret thing. And that really comes out of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, that Daniel reveals mysteries. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and Daniel reveals it to him. The book of Revelation. World. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, Enoch is a, um, a prophet, uh, who God reveals secrets to, and some of those secrets are revealed in the book. And as you kind of work your way towards the end of the book, uh, he has he has other things he's not allowed to reveal, and that's kind of one of the. It's a trope in an apocalyptic book. Is is the prophet always gets a lot more information uh, than he's willing to let on? So I guess you have to come back and get his other book or something like that. Read my second book, that kind of a thing. Uh, but Enoch is. A prophet, God reveals secrets to him. Some of those secrets are revealed in the book, and then others are held back for another time. Okay, so the secrets that were re revealed in, in in those books, did any of them come to fruition? Uh, they're not necessarily prophecies like, um, you know, predictions of, of future events. Um, uh, one of the big secrets, and I mentioned this earlier, and it seems to us, this seems really dumb. Uh, but one of the big secrets is that the year is 365 days long, not 360. So this was in the first century, a really big deal. So if you're a Jew and you have a 360 day calendar, your Sabbaths are going to line up on certain days and the day of atonement is going to be on a certain day and these sorts of things. If you have a 365 day calendar, well, those are all going to be on different days. So if you're using the wrong calendar, you might be profaning the Sabbath by accident. You might be working on the Day of Atonement or not fasting on the Day of Atonement, and you're, you're, you're profaning that day. So within early Judaism, time of Jesus, one of the biggest controversial questions is, which calendar do you use? And Enoch has a huge section arguing it should be 365 days. So it, that's one of the reasons why the, the people who collected the Dead Sea Scrolls probably preserved it, is it agreed with their calendar. The so, Jews in the temple were using a different calendar. So were they use, so, so whenever, they, whenever they started finding out of the Book of Enoch, sorry, I'm trying to yeah. grasp this a little bit. Was it true, they went to 365-day calendar, did he kind of, allege, in that book, is, does it give him truth to that, that... that well, he, he says this is the right and true calendar, and righteous people use this calendar. For I mean, for me, I don't care what calendar you use. <laughs> yeah. you know, it doesn't matter to make you righteous or not. But in that particular historical context, keeping those, those, those special feast days was so important. Right. You do them on the wrong day— you know, you're, you're, you're in a mess of trouble. And so the, the revelation— is you got to use this calendar, not that one. Now, to us, that's not what we're looking for in a revelation. 
Right. I mean, on, on, well, people want to know who the Antichrist is. No, that's that's, that's, that's still, not what's in that, Enoch. That's still uh, significant, though. Like if they, like you said, how important this is, and they were using a 360 day calendar, and then out of nowhere they, I guess this, what I'm saying is, is this would kind of get, give credit to Enoch actually being an author at some point in maybe the yeah, first book. It's, it's he ends up being on the closer to the right side of science. You know, it's he's not even quite right. You need another extra quarter day in there to even it up. Um, but you know, the the eventually we end up using a 365 and a quarter day calendar with leap years and all that sort of thing. It it, it works out better astronomically. So he's reflecting astronomical wisdom, not ast- astrological, but astronomical knowledge. Uh, and, and maybe that comes from uh, Babylon. They had the same sort of debates and they had the same sort of questions. Uh, and ba- there are Babylonian um, astrological texts that argue the same sorts of things. There's a really good argument to be made that, that the, the section that discusses the lengths of years uh, is based on some of that Babylonian thing. And of course, Jews were in Captivity in Babylon for centuries, and and may, that may actually influence what we read in the book of, of Enoch. So Enoch is is uh, again, it's a a fiction. You know, Enoch isn't really revealing these things, but the writer is saying, here is the you know the the great prophet from the ancient of days. He's revealing to us the mystery of the calendar, or where did evil come from? It so, came from these angels, and so on. I think so. The big conspiracy, I guess, behind who the true author of the Book of Enoch, they, from what I read online, and correct me if I'm wrong, some people believe it was a philosopher in the 14th century or something like that. Am I not mistaken? I I I, I don't know uh, if anybody would say that. You would you would be, it would be hard to argue that because so much of parts of Enoch appear in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which predate the first century. Right. So, you know, if you have a 150 BC manuscript of Enoch, even if it's in Greek, not Ethiopic, it's the same text. Um, how could it be written in the 14th century? Discovered in the 14th century, um, um, not, not discovered, earliest, earliest preserved manuscripts in the 14th century, uh, translated into English in the 19th century. But uh, I don't know of anybody who would say first Enoch was written I, and I may have I may have mistaken yeah. on that. Like yeah. I said, I, be, I believe that they said that there was some there's a possible person who maybe was the author. I can't remember the time frame. That's vaguely yeah. what I remember. So I should probably look it up. And I would verify. say in, in contemporary Enoch scholarship, uh, I don't know if anybody says anything like that. And gotcha. believe it or not, there is contemporary Enoch scholarship. <laughs> okay, so we are getting close to the end of the hour. Um, I like to just kind of branch away a little bit. We can just, yeah. you know what I'm saying? We, we've definitely hit hard on the, the the book of Enoch. And man, that yeah, again, thank you so much. It was really fun. I don't know if there's anything that you missed that you want to say right now. But I mean, what do you, I, I forgot to ask you, what do you do and why do you do you it? Cut, yeah, you cut out there. I forgot to uh, inter, introduce you at the very beginning. What do we do? Yeah, no, I forgot to ask you who you were or who yeah, you are and uh, what do you do? Sorry, at the beginning. Yeah, um, you can edit this and put it at the beginning, I guess. Um, I I teach uh, biblical studies at a place called Grace Christian University. Uh, I've been doing this since about 1998. So um, I teach, uh, I've taught Old Testament. I have a master's degree in Old Testament. My PhD is in New Testament. Uh, but my uh, my field of study was uh, uh, Gospels and early Judaism. Um, so I've done a lot of Jesus stuff, historical Jesus stuff, um, read a lot of uh, early Jewish material, which is what got me into Enoch and this other uh, uh, Old Testament apocrypha and pseudepigrapha. So. Okay. So a PhD in New Testament, what is that? So like you, you know, absolutely. I mean, for the most part, you know, quite a bit of stuff about it. Yeah. I have a degree that says I do. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you can, you can, right, you can pay twenty nine ninety five. You can have one too. No, um, I took, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've got a master's in, New, in uh, biblical exposition and a master's in Old Testament, and then I did uh, New Testament studies, which would mean I, I read, um, you know, the whole New Testament. I do uh, Jesus studies. I do a lot of Paul stuff. My I have a fascination with the book of Acts, and so I've done a lot of stuff on the book of Acts over the years. Um, I have uh, I have led um, trips to Israel. We go to Israel and Jordan every other year, and I've done that uh, this year. May will be my 11th trip. 
And I just started, I've done four trips to Turkey. Uh, so uh, examining uh, biblical sites, uh, Ephesus and those kind of places, taking tours of those. Uh, so I've done a lot of biblical studies, travel, that sort of thing. So, have you, so yeah, New Testament's my gig, I guess. So you've been to the place where Jesus was allegedly born or buried, sorry? I, I'm, yeah, I'm both. Not, okay. uh, <laughs> they're different places, but they're real close. Yeah, okay. usually we go to the uh, traditional site of the crucifixion and burial. It's called the Holy Sepulchre, um, and it's a big, fascinating historical church. Uh, may or may not be the actual place, but uh, the Catholics and Greek Orthodox think it is. What type of feeling do you get when you go in there? I hate the place. It's just so many people, and they're all literally loud and rude, and um, I'm a flaming Protestant, and so it's not, <laughs> it's not my favorite place to visit. Uh, but there's another place that's not too far from there called the Garden Tomb, which uh, isn't at all the place where Jesus was buried, uh, but it is a tomb you can visit, and it's much more quiet and reflective, and I, I prefer to take my students there. But you go into the, the Holy Sepulchre because there's crusader history there, and it's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of tradition just pounded into that place. Sure. Um, and it is it is fascinating to go but, to. But being almost like a scholar in in you know the the new and old testament, um, doesn't that like do you ever get like the the urge to find those places where maybe Jesus was crucified or where he was buried or oh, where yeah. he was born? Like yeah, that's you, one of you, the things when, when you, I do those tours. Um, I, there are a few places where I can say, you know, without a doubt, you know, if you're you know you're the Western Wall, the the they used to call it the Wailing Wall. I can't say that I do, no, sorry. Okay. There's, there's, it's the western wall of the old Jewish temple, uh, and there's a spot there where they've excavated the steps that Jesus would have walked up to to go into the temple, because that's the only steps you can walk up to to go into the temple. So I'll tell the people on my tour, this is a place where you can say, Jesus walked here. And whether he stepped on that exact brick or not, I don't know. But um, you know, this is a place that you can say is excavated to... You know, before 70 AD, you know, we, we have evidence of the destruction of Jerusalem in, in AD 70. Nobody doubts that happened. The stuff has been buried since then, and it's been excavated to that level. There's all kinds of places in Jerusalem where you can go to and say, yeah, this is the place where Jesus would have walked, or this is the place where, you know, the disciples would have been uh, when they were teaching in the temple in the book of Acts, that kind of thing. So there's, you know, there's nothing ahead. there's nothing in in the bibles that said, that state hey this is exactly where he was born or this is exactly where he died or was resurrected type of thing. Yeah. Uh well Bethlehem is uh, Bethlehem is Bethlehem it always has been. Uh what happens is uh, very early on um Constantine who was the emperor Roman emperor who became a Christian uh, his mother uh, Helena Queen Helena went on a basically a holy land tour and she would turn up in Jerusalem and ask the locals where is the tomb they buried Jesus in? And they would say, well, this one over here. And she donates money and they build a church on it. So um, if there's if there's traditions that go back to Helena, there's a there's a a guy named um, the Bordeaux Pilgrim who went on a tour and, you know, took notes and this sort of thing. We have traditions that might go back to three or four hundred A.D. And those are based on local testimony. Yeah, this is the place that we always think it was. Same thing, Peter's house in Capernaum. We think it's over here. Um, sometimes and usually I'll tell my people there's kind of a scale where I'll say this is a, a nine out of ten this is probably the place where Jesus was buried, or this is probably the place where Peter was. But you can't ever have 100%, right. you know, in, in, even if Jesus wrote his name on the rock, people would doubt it. So right. it's, you know, and there are other places we take them, and I say, this is so not the place <laughs> that this happened. This is just a, a tourist trap, or this is, you know, something the, the church put here, and we just don't know. Yeah, for sure. And so we've had like authors on before, Howdy Mikowski, he talks about, you know, it may be, and this isn't that far back. He's, we're talking 18, 1700s. Mm -hmm. of just whenever people would go into buildings or, or sorry, and he never scratch that. He says when he goes into like cathedrals and old churches mm -hmm. and stuff like that, he says it's just a different feeling. Like maybe yeah. at some point that these churches were something more than, and, and this, um, he probably goes a little bit against the Bible, but what I'm saying, he, and it, it could be either his way or the other way. I'm not saying whichever one's right. Yeah. But what I'm so saying the, is you get a feeling. I, I there is a there is a, a a sacred space. This is this is the place where this happened. Uh, I think I think old cathedrals kind of have that feel to them for sure. Um, the the problem with you know, my sort of dislike of the Holy Sepulchre is it's been turned into so much of a religious thing 
that it's lost its sacredness. Now, maybe if I was there at five o'clock in the morning all by myself, that would be something different. But, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon when the tour groups are plowing through there, it isn't as it isn't as as a. Uh, intriguing but there are other places i've been to in in israel that you know i i get a, a more of a, a charge out of going to a, a historical archaeological site right where i could say man this is a you know 1200 bc canaanite house and this is an israelite fortress from a thousand bc you know those are things that i can i can say this is what this is what it looked like then and and I think uh, there are places in Jerusalem, there's places in Galilee that you get that, you know, for the New Testament as well. Oh, and if I'm not mistaken, they're always ex- excavating, you know, just recently, I feel like a year ago, I saw a video where they just, this dude in his backyard just started digging and boom, there was just like this very old structure. Yeah. I think I've, I've done, as I said, I've done 10 trips since 2005. And every time I'm in Jerusalem, there's there's more to see, you know. Um, you know, it didn't look like that two years ago. They've they've excavated and opened up more to see, um, and it, it's it, much of it is very helpful for understanding the context and historical backgrounds of the Bible, New Testament. Okay, so this is a big question of mine. Um, I, I meant to ask Randy last week, um, and I didn't get a chance to. But why does why where how can we prove that God is a He and not like maybe an entity? Or a she, or you know what I'm saying? Like, is it, you yeah. know, just growing up, everyone's like, hey, he, 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 his glory, his yeah. power. That's a, that's an, a, that's a, um, I guess, a side effect of the language. Um, you have to use a pronoun, and they always use the masculine pronoun. I would say God doesn't, he doesn't have a gender in the same way that we have a gender. There isn't a girl God that he dates, you know. It's, <laughs> <laughs> He's, it, yeah, I, he, I, I don't mind calling him an entity because I get what you mean by that. Sure. But I guess if I got up in my church and said, let's pray to the holy entity God, um, you know, there, I get hymnals thrown at me. Uh, but if I, you know, you <laughs> refer to God the Father, he's a he. It just, that's the, that's the, the metaphor for under, of, of expressing whatever the divine Godhead is. He's not like us. Okay. So what would, yeah. what would, and, and, what would be your biggest message to people who aren't maybe religious or interested in the Bible and haven't really given it a chance or gotten into it and, you know, maybe believe in a creator or believe in, you know, yeah. what it is outside of the Bible? What would be your biggest message to those people? Um, I'd don't... like to give them a list of people not to listen to, if that makes any sense. Right. Don't listen to those yahoos, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, just, you know, there's there's it's a lot more uh, uh, historical, rational. If you understand it in its original context, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. If you know much about Mormonism, there's things in Mormonism in the Book of Mormon that are just historically inaccurate. You know, it's just that that that's not even true. Um, that's that's unprovable. In fact, you don't get that with Old Testament. You don't get that with New Testament. There are some problems, and you know, we have to we have to talk about those. And, and I think I'm honest about those. But a lot of it fits into the historical context of the ancient world and and um, I, I think you know it's it, 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 it isn't a it isn't a pie in the sky uh, religion it, it really is something that fits well into the historical context and it makes you ask it asks you questions that you need to answer about the nature of reality the nature of our relationship with with a creator of some sort um, how do you express that rock on well, I, I don't have any more questions, Jesse. I know you kind of walked in. You've briefly kind of got into it a little bit. I did give a little bit of your background to to Phil to Philip. But I mean, if you have any questions, man, I mean, like I said, we got a couple more minutes with him. I don't I don't know if you have any. I've just never heard it pronounced uh, Enoch before. <laughs> that was uh, that was the first thing, which I'm sure that you've already talked about. That's no, no, another... we didn't. Huh? Oh, you yeah. didn't. Enoch versus Enoch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I grew up on the West Coast. That's why we say it out there. <laughs> okay, so I just figured that you were like super accurate, and you had already asked that question, and you're like, no, this is how it's pronounced. No, no, like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Okay, uh-uh, no, I, I get that every once in a while. I say Enoch, and I hear Enoch, and then it, somebody else. I thought it was Enoch. Well, it's you know, whatever. Oh, no, it's just a regional thing. Okay, all right, <laughs> <laughs> that, that makes sense too. In the south, they say he's Enoch or something. I don't know. So. <laughs> Rock on, Phil, man. It's been it's been a pleasure, man, having you on. Where can we find your book? Where can we find? Do you have a, a website where people can find you? Yeah, um, my website's called readingacts.com, uh, and um, I've been blogging there for I don't know about fifteen years now. 
Uh, and so it's a it's a pretty active site. I'm doing uh, I do biblical studies on there all the time, do some book reviews, uh, working my way through Matthew. So I think I'm at Matthew 26 now. But I've gone through most of the New Testament over the years uh, on that site, and I've done uh, this is kind of how the Book of Enoch uh, Enoch uh, uh, <laughs> kind of came about in the first place, as I posted all of that material on my blog. Um, and I did a bunch of stuff on second Enoch and third and, um, Testament of patriarchs and second Baruch and fourth Ezra, tons of stuff. Uh, and that constantly gets hits because there just aren't that many people on the internet discussing some of those obscure books. Uh, so I have a lot of that on there, uh, available for people. Um, the book, I see people do this on the, on the, pimping their books. Yeah. Uh, it's on Amazon. Um, so you can get it on amazon.com. Um, you can get it. It's pretty cheap in Kindle uh, and it's in the Kindle unlimited. So, um, you know, if you, if you want to, if you're in Kindle unlimited, you can get it for free and, you know, part of your subscription. So, uh, it's, yeah, I, I, I love, that. yeah. I didn't even think about that cause I have, I have the Kindle, but, uh, I, dude, I bought the paperback, man. Thank I you. have to have the paperback. <laughs> Uh, so it's great, greatly appreciated you having on. And again, all those links will be in the description below so people can literally click it as yep. opposed to trying to rewind and fast forward and hear your voice say it and type it out. They can just press a button and take you straight to where your book is at. Yeah. Um, I'd love to have you on again, man, at some yep. point, some other time. And I, I again, I'm, I'm on a on a journey trying to figure out uh, the origins. And I know that that's almost an impossible feat. You, you might argue against that. But, I mean, I'm fascinated by the Cathars, oh, I, the, the Gnostics, all that, those yeah. types of people. So. It's all very fascinating. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I'd love to get into the demiurge and reincarnation. That's another thing I wanted to talk to you about was reincarnation. So it's just oh, look like we're out of time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Till next time, man. Philip, thanks for joining Talk Junkies, man. I appreciate you, and you have a, a wonderful rest of your evening. All right. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Philip Long, a very interesting gentleman. He had a lot of great information to to oh. shout out to you all right there. So. Uh, the best thing you guys can do for this podcast is is hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, share this to all your friends and family, to all your junkies out there. Stay fly and ring the bell. <laughs> it's the only reason why I came down here was to just say that one line. Yeah, fair there enough, man. <laughs> you still like chatting with him afterwards? <laughs>